the Old Testament as well as in the God complete plan of program concerning the covenants and his future and the future program except this there is not the fullness of God's revelation concerning the church and that is your New Testament revelation and chapter 3 in the book of Ephesians is devoted specifically to the unfolding of that truth which is a mystery which is the equal uh, plane of existence of Jew and Gentile in one body in, the, uh, uh, in one body called the body of Christ now that is the mystery or that is the fullness of the revelation of God God has has no further secrets we have the full revelation of the full program of God right here in our Bibles and uh, I'm thankful for this great truth uh, concerning the church now then when you come to chapter 4 chapter 5 and chapter 6 you are dealing with the spiritual needs of the church first the spiritual nature of the church and then the spiritual needs of the church and, how, and we have spent uh, many many Sundays dealing with this but let's once again just briefly review in our thinking chapter 4 deals with the spiritual need of the church as far as the worthy walk the worthy walk and basically that worthy walk is that we might walk worthy of the calling wherewith we are called endeavoring to keep the unity of the faith and he gives to us then a number of uh, classifications concerning what the unity of the faith is and then his great provisions uh, equipping all of the saints whereby that they might walk in light of the unity of the faith and every Christian has some particular spiritual gift as you have in Ephesians 4 chapter, uh, uh, verses 7 and 8 then when you come on down to verse 11 you have the special provisions of God by virtue of leadership in the local ministries as far as the overall body of Christ. When you come to chapter 5, you have the wonderful, wonderful walk of the believer. First, the worthy walk, and then uh, secondly, the wonderful walk that we should be imitators of God as God's dear children. Now, in that section, chapter 5 through chapter 6 verse 9 dealing with this wonderful walk of the believer the first thing that he starts out with is this that we might be imitators of God as dear children there is the standard and that's a perfect standard and that would that will constitute the wonderful walk of the believer and he deals then with the children in the family of God coming down in that same section he then deals with the earthly family wives husbands children and then he deals with the third classification in light of this wonderful walk and that is people in the workforce the family that's at work so there's that threefold division of the wonderful walk before God that we should walk as beloved children as dear children of God then the families the earthly families a absolutely inspired commentary as to how wives should live how husbands should live and how parents and children should live and then how men and women should live in light of the workforce but when you come to chapter 6 <coughs> beginning with verse 10 and running primarily through chapter 18 he says I want to remind you something as you're in this pilgrim journey not only a worthy walk is encumbered upon the church the body of Christ all believers not only the wonderful walk of all believers upon the face of this earth but listen it's a warfaring walk and in this entire great spiritual deed of the walk of the believer we've got an enemy and that enemy is a very very wicked person and we've been dealing with this for some time beginning with verse 10 down through verse 18 
here you have the top secret communication from heaven with reference to the strategy and the identification of our enemy and that is we should be that we are to stand against the methodia or the tactics or the strategy or the methods of the devil and he goes on to point out then that our warfare and all people remember this will you our warfare is not with people it's not with flesh and blood but by the devil who has great spiritual forces and great spiritual powers as you find in verse 12 against principalities, against powers, against world rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. Now, these spiritual forces work through humanity, work through people. Now, let me zero in on just an illustration in light of this section. If you are having trouble in the home, if you're having trouble on the job, if you're having trouble with the kids, if you're having trouble with yourself, you know something? <coughs> in essence, it's not with the people. It is the work of the devil behind people. Now you've got to remember that. And I wish to goodness that our homes would realize that the problems in the homes are not just because you're married or not married or the kids kicking up. It is the devil at work, that spiritual force that works in the children of disobedience among whom we all had our conduct in days past. So kids, if you are a rebellious, parents, if you're not getting along, husbands and wives, if you're not getting along, you may want to uh, put ground glass in his coffee or something like that. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, I, I can appreciate how you might feel, but just remember something. It happens to be the devil that's causing you to do this. We've got to recognize that this is a spiritual battle. Then, when you come on down to uh, verse 13 through 18, he begins to talk, and it's wonderful now that he identifies for us the other side of this great battle. On the one side, it's Satan and his wicked force, and all you have to do is just go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and that happens to be uh, the, uh, the nutshell of, Galatians, uh, of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, but now, here he deals with the saints. And the one thing that he wants the saints to do, he doesn't want the saints to be casualties. So stand. Three times this word occurs here. Stand, 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 or withstand. And we have observed that in this particular section, uh, that we are to appropriate a provision. We're not making it. We don't go out and build the battleships. We don't go out and make the guns. We don't go out and uh, form uh, work in, in the ammunition uh, factories to create uh, the bullets and so forth. We are to appropriate a provision which our commander-in-chief, our Heavenly Father, has provided. And that is to appropriate. Analambano is to take up or to appropriate the whole armor of God in order that you might be able to withstand in the evil day and having wrought all of these things, having worked out these things, having appropriated these things, now stand. And then when he comes to verse 14, down through verse 15, I believe that we have zeroed in for us in light of this top secret communication from the heavenlies uh, the, a threefold defensive aspect of the whole armor of God. And that is having our loins girded with truth, uh, having on uh, being empowered with the breastplate of righteousness and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, these three areas, uh, our strength, our heart, and our walk, uh, 
here you have the great defense whereby we're going to be able to stand. Now then, when you come to verse 16 through 18, here are the offensive aspects with the provision that he has just made. And we've got to this point in our study, and we're going to finish this up uh, this morning, Lord willing. Now then, let me just simply read for you from my Greek New Testament, and you follow along in your English. It's not going to be a great deal of difference, but I'm going to, uh, to read it from here. With all, or with in all of these things, or with all of these things. With all of what? All right. The loins girded with truth, breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation. With all of this now, with all of these things, now he says, listen, appropriate, take up, receive <coughs> the what? The shield of faith. The shield of faith, what for? What for? In order that you might be empowered to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. You're in a battle now. Now the shield is also a defensive thing, but look, in, in, in a fight, you're going to be walking, isn't that right? You're supposed to be standing, you are not to be a casualty. All right, here is the only defensive, uh, uh, the only protective aspect of this armor is the shield, and it's a shield of faith. I'm told in the book of Ephesians, as well as so many other places, that as the Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation of everyone that believes the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith unto faith. Isn't that right? All right. It's from the appropriation of faith unto a walk of faith. Unto a warfare of faith. Now listen. If you are not going to walk trusting him, you're already shot. You're already a casualty. And if you and I are going to trust in this pilgrim journey, in the temporal things of life, you're already headed for the hospital. You need spiritual treatment. And you have to go there. We trust to get well. I'm to walk trusting him. I don't care whether it's on the job, whether it's home, or wherever it is. I've got to be living on faith. Now, faith isn't stupidity. Faith has a perfect standard. This Bible is often called the body of faith. Understand that? And if you and I are not going to walk according to the body of faith, again, we're a casualty. We're not appropriating the full provision of God. And he says that we might be able to quench. And that is to just stifle or to put it out. And I'll tell you, it says all of the fiery darts. The battle can get hot. The battle can get uh, extremely difficult in this pilgrim journey. All you have to do is to try to walk with the Lord and you're going to see how hot it does get. And those who know anything about a life of dedication become an extremely uh, obvious target of the devil. You've got to, you've got to walk and warfare God's way because you can't fight against these spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. They're, you're no match for them. Absolutely not, dear people. Now that is one of the first great offensive weapons, and I say offensive even though it looks like it's a defensive weapon, you're to quench it. You're to stop it by this. Now, how many has fallen this week? How many has bit the dust this week? Do you know why? Because we haven't been walking in fellowship with the Lord, that's why. Now, secondly, notice this. <clears throat> and uh, here, here is a command. And take, receive, decomai. It's the Greek word for welcome. Receive joyously. 
the great welcome. Now, in one of my Bible studies down in Dallas when I was in seminary, you've heard me speak of the Nelsons. Um, Paul was a prisoner of war. He got shot down over Germany. He was a bomber, a bombardier. And he was taken prisoner. And um, we got to talking something about it since both of us were veterans. He said it was a great day when they were liberated. It was a great day when that prisoner of war camp, that stockade, that barbed wire, all those gates were opened up. When they were captured, one of the fellows said, they're going to shoot us, they're going to shoot us. And Paul said, shut up. Just don't say anything. We were given instruction if we were taken uh, captive, uh, captive, why we could only give two things. We could give our name and we could give our serial number. I don't know about others, but that's all we could give. And we were threatened by our own outfit. If we gave any more than that, we'd be giving away secrets. And maybe they wouldn't shoot us, but our own group could shoot us. Now, here you've got it. You take. You take something. And there's two things that you're to take as a welcome. And he said, I'll tell you, I sure took my liberty with a welcome. Receive as a welcome the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The great delight of these two, two things, and it's a command, receive with a welcome. What? The helmet of salvation. I don't believe for a minute this is talking about us getting saved. It's in the last part of the book of Ephesians talking about the warfare of the believer. The believer's warfare, <coughs> listen, you better have things settled in your mind that you belong to Jesus Christ. James says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Isn't that right? And if you're resting your salvation on some funny feeling that you've received running up and down your backbone, I'll tell you, friend, you're not going to stand. Someone else is going to come along and say, Oh, but you've got to have the experience that I've had. Oh, yeah, if you just felt like this, then you are really a child of God. Listen. Hey is trusting what he said. And I love it. It's called the description. It's a generative of description. Take the helmet of faith. Telling me the, uh, uh, the kind of faith that is being described. It is a helmet type salvation. I used the word faith there. I meant salvation. It's a helmet type salvation. Now what does a helmet do? It is that particular piece of armor that protects the head, isn't that right? But it has another purpose too, folks. It has a purpose of identifying. Now, in war, sometimes the only thing you see is a helmet. Well, you can tell your enemy by the kind of helmet he's got on, isn't that right? And... Uh, uh, the Allied forces, they had their own type of helmets. Well, they, they knew they, they knew who, uh, who they were. But I'll tell you, our, our, our enemies, they had a different kind of helmet. And so that's the kind of helmet you shot at. All right? Take the helmet of salvation. Have things settled in your thinking as well as have a proper identification. You walking out there being a casually because you're not identified with the people of God. You're not identified with the person who saved you. 
and people have to come up to you in all honesty and sincere, oh, are you a Christian? I didn't know that. Right down here in Algoma Steel Plant. I've told you this illustration. A fellow got on the plane with me and he just wouldn't let me sleep and so I said, okay, we're going to talk about something sensible and so we started talking about the Lord. He told me where he worked. And so he wanted to know what kind of a so-called Christian I was and I said, well, maybe he'll know if I identify myself with some particular person there in Algoma. And I said, have you ever heard of this fellow's name? And I gave him the name. Oh, yeah. Well, sure I did. I said, well, that particular person b believes basically what I believe. And he said this, and this fellow's an elder. Oh, and this guy had been there f for a year, a whole year. Oh, I didn't know that. But his next words were, he sure got a good job. This unsaved fellow didn't know that guy was a, a believer, but he envied his good money-making job. You better have on the right type of identification in your walk. Have the helmet of salvation. Kids in school, you act any different? You talk any different? You look any different? Hmm? Take the helmet of salvation. And now, the sword of the Spirit. That's the kind of sword. It's the spiritual sword, isn't it? What is it? It's the Word of God. I believe with all my heart one of the greatest reasons for the casualties in the household of faith today is because God's people are not availing themselves of the great provision of the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And I know this is true with reference to young people. I know it is. They'll head off to universities and colleges to be taught by the devil's crowd instead of first of all getting grounded in the Word of God and then go out there in the warfare and be able to stand. Casualties. One of the greatest source of casualties for young women today happens to be a boy. We've lost some prime girls at Northland because a fellow came along and asked him to marry him. And some of those girls are down the tube. Right down the tube spiritually because they didn't have enough of the Word of God. They hadn't sat under leadership whereby they were equipped get into immorality. Parents cry. And I'm shocked to hear the immorality that's going on today right in our community. Give the Spirit of God something to fight with, eh? That's the book. That's the book. You're a casualty. You won't stand. You can't stand. Because you don't have. You have been disobedient to the top secret message of the commander-in-chief of the strategy and the supply for the warfare. Don't blame someone else. Don't you dare do it. You haven't either appropriated it or secondly, you haven't allowed the Spirit
Spirit of God to use it. Do you know why? Because in the fourth chapter you're there. Grieve not the Spirit of God whereby you're sealed in the day of salvation. You're not walking whereby the Spirit of God can take the Word of God and to fight an enemy that you can't whip. It's just, again, it's John chapter 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. Appropriate and practice. That's the one that's going to be loving me. That's the one that's going to be standing. Now then, the third, the third great offensive weapon. Oh man, how I love this. This is the order which you're going to find, which we noticed in our study in Daniel last night up at Search Month. How Daniel was reading in the book, and then verse 3, he went to prayer, isn't that right? He was a man of the word, he was a man of prayer. Okay, if you're going to be able to stand in this warfare, you're going to have to be one of the book, and you're going to, be, have, to, you're going to have to be a person that knows how to get on your knees. If you don't get on your knees physically, you ought to get on your knees spiritually in your heart. Oh, listen to this. Praying, what? Praying always. With all prayer and supplication, how? In the Spirit. Having that sweet relationship to the Spirit of God, whereby the communication lines are going to be absolutely clear. And there's not going to be the garbling of the enemy that tries to jam the waves. The same one, same one that's going to wield that sword is also the one that wants your heart in relationship to headquarters absolutely clear as you carry on communication between the Father and your heart in this battle. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and then doing what? Being alive. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for what? I love this. For the salvation of the world? No! For all saints. The reason the world isn't saved is because the saints are a total casualty and are not outreaching the lost because they're in the spiritual hospital or they're in a the great big nursery where they got a bunch of nurses with a bottle jammed in their mouth. Babies. Babies. Or their kids rebellious, kicking over the traces, refusing to walk by faith, refusing to appropriate the word, and have absolutely no, absolutely no sense of the significance of a prayer life. Do you know why I know that's a danger here at Northland? Come to prayer meeting Thursday night and you'll find out. That's right. Sad, folks, but have I told you the truth? I haven't tried to be mean to you. You know it yourself. Problem. Everything else takes priority except the top secret message from glory. How that you and I can be victorious in the great walk of the church. The great spiritual needs. Worthy walk. A wonderful walk. And a victorious warfaring walk. Where are you? And where am I? With reference to
to a believer in the church and the body of Christ. Brethren, brethren, it's not a wish that you'd stand, but they're imperatives. Stand. Our Father, thank you for your wonderful grace, your love, the great secrets that you've given to us from the communication center in the glories. And Father, some way, somehow, enable the household of faith to appropriate. Appropriate. These secrets give the believer hearts and desires to have Jesus Christ first in their life. The spiritual first in their life. Instead of the temporal, the flesh, desires of the mind. Oh, our God, we thank you that you've made a provision whereby we don't have to be casualties. We're not casualties because of your work, Father. We're casualties because of our rejection and rebellion of the appropriation of your provision because we want to walk in the world as part of the world. Our God, we pray, oh, in these closing days of apostasy and chaos, that you speak to the household of faith in strong terms. Move upon their wills to make them willing to do your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>